Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, 8th of March, 2024, Ron Mayfield is going to wow us with some of his saltwater patterns. And later in the weekly tip, I'll be talking about a new, well, maybe not so new, but a new material that uh, you might find of interest. But for now, let's uh, talk about Ron Mayfield. You're looking at a fly, and uh, one of his flies there in the in the in the picture, and uh, Ron has been fishing since he was four years old, and fly fishing and fly tying since he was thirteen. That's more than fifty years. Growing up on the Texas Gulf Coast, Ron specializes in tying warm water and saltwater fly patterns, and he is known for his innovative deer hair patterns, such as the lily pad jumping frog, the mohawk pin, mohawk minnow pinfish. That was featured in Fly Tire Magazine, by the way. And the Umpqua Rattle Mullet. Ron is currently an Umpqua fly designer and an FFI casting instructor. Tonight he is presenting two of his saltwater patterns, the Jerk Bee Bend Back and the Rattle Mullet. And Ron, I'll switch to the recipes whenever you tell me to. But for now, the stage is yours. Thanks, Alan Gretchen. It, it's such a pleasure to be on with you all again. I consider it an honor to be on here. So what we're, we're going to talk about tonight is a technique for deer hair that I call flaring hair. It's a little different than spinning or stacking. And this is a technique I developed many years ago. And as you can see from this fly, this technique allows you to be very specific on where you put hair. So this pattern, this is actually a sunfish pattern for warm water. And you can see I have green, chartreuse, black, purple, and then it's a repeating pattern. Green, chartreuse, black, purple, green, all the way down. And on the bottom, I have kind of a dark orange, then yellow, bright orange, yellow, orange, yellow, orange, all the way up to the front where I can have that darker orange. This technique allows you to put hair exactly where you want it. And I developed this many years ago because I did want to mimic a sunfish pattern that has stripes, the uh, vertical stripes. And this technique allowed me to be very specific with the colorations. This, this is the Mohawk minnow, and I did name it that. The guys in the Texas Fly Fishing, fly fishing Club, the ones that named it. And obviously because of the, the fin up here, they call it a Mohawk. Um, but this has been a very successful pattern over the years. And there's also some saltwater versions. Like Al talked about the pinfish pattern. Pinfish is a type of saltwater bait fish that kind of looks like a sunfish, but the coloration is different. So the last time I was on, we talked about flaring deer hair. So Al, if it's okay with you, I'll go ahead and do a little bit of flaring. Just again, show the technique. I think that's a good idea because our, our, the crew that watches, uh, there's, there's some hardcore ones. But uh, we have an ever-changing group, an ever-growing group, so please. Okay, so I'll do a quick little flaring to show the technique. So I'm not going to tie an entire fly. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is this black thing. Okay, that is a lead egg weight. And we use this offshore for our deep sea fishing. It's a lead egg weight. And as you can see, what I did is I, I cut it. I put it in a vise and I cut it. And then I drilled out the end of it. Then I coated it in a plastic. This is the kind of plastic you can buy at the hardware store for coating uh, tool handles. So I just paint that on there to keep the lead off my fingers. But what this does, it gives me about three or four ounces of constant weight on the thread. And that's important, as you'll see here in a second. So the goal is to be able, like I said, control exactly where you put the hair. So I'm going to get some multiple colors so you can see how I do this. So first, I'm going to start with a green. Okay, here's the finger technique. I'm going to put two fingers under the hook and one on top. I'm going to put the hair and pinch it between the two fingers and the top. 
And then for this first punch to anchor it, I'm going to make just two twists. And then I'm going to pull down, pinching between the fingers and hold it in place. Then I'm going to keep it from spinning with one finger. Then with the other finger and thumb, I'm going to pull the hair out of the way and make about four or five anchor wraps. Now, if I do this correctly, I should have hair 180 degrees on top of the hook. Now, the four ounces constant thread pressure is very important because, as we all know, deer hair is hollow. If you look at it under a microscope, it looks like a soda straw with foam in it. And it's that ability to compress that allows the hair to, to flare up like this. Okay. But because it, it is hollow, if I don't have this pressure constantly on the thread, it will expand back out. The hair will, with that little thread on it, will expand out and you'll get a very loose tie. When I first developed this technique, I didn't have this weight. And I was putting hair on exactly where I wanted it, but it was so loose that after catching five or six bass, the fly would start falling apart. So as soon as I put this weight on and kept the constant tension on the thread, not a problem. So now I'm going to do the same thing, but on the bottom side of the hook. I'm going to get a different color. Again. Two fingers underneath, one on top. I'm going to pull the hair out of the way. Put the hair between two fingers. This time I'm just going to make one wrap. And I'm going to pull down and pinch. And then flare the hair, or pull the hair back as it flares. And so now I have hair on the bottom of the hook. Then it's just a matter of going down the hook using whatever colors you want. You vary the amount of hair depending upon how thick or thin you want your stripes to be. And once you get this technique down, it can go very fast. What thread are you using? Oh, good question. I use Flymaster Plus 240. I've been using Flymaster Plus for, what, 30 years? And then after a few pieces of hair, you can pack it in. And that's the technique. It's kind of simple, but the key again, though, is getting the weight on your, your bobbin holder so that you have constant tension on the thread. <clears throat> what did you use to pack that thread with? So oh, okay. this is one of the little brass packers. Now, there is a trick to using this one. You don't want the jaws to come together because what that does, it'll cut the thread. You want them to overlap just a little bit so the hole can get very small so that you're pushing the thread. Let me do it this way. So you're pushing the thread all the way down the hook. So overlap it a little bit. If you do that, you wind up cutting the thread. You want to make the hole small. Mm. It's about a two ounce weight. Am I correct, sir? It's a it's a six ounce lead egg weight, okay. but I cut off about two or a little more ounces, so I'm closer to four ounces. Thank you, sir. Okay, so that's, that's the basic technique, and it's really all about the fingers. Two below, one above, put the hair in, pinch it in place, pull the thread down, flare it out, pull the hair back, do your anchor wraps, and you're good. Any questions? Okay. So... I'm just going to do a couple of half hitches to tie this off. And just real quick, I'll go ahead and cut the hair. 
and you can see how you can make all sorts of nice little colors. It's a matter of practice determining how much hair you put on for what size stripes. All right. Now, the thing I wanted to cover is that this technique allows you to put hair over pretty much anything. So you're not limited to just putting hair on the hook. Okay, so the next one I'm going to tie is the jerk me bend back fly. You want me to pop up that recipe for you? Yeah, please do. Please do. All right, it's on the way up. Right now, it's on screen. Okay, thank you. And if you go to the, see the autumn edition of Fly Tire Magazine, you can see exactly how to do this fly, follow step by step. Okay, this fly uses a bin back hook. Finally, after many years of not having bin back hooks out there, Umpco came out with a really nice, sturdy uh, bin back fly. I like this because it uses a very thick wire. It's a very strong hook. All right, so I'm going to start this fly. So there's your bin back hook. Oh, I almost forgot. This is what's neat about this fly. It sits on the bottom just like this. And it's about as weedless as you can make it. We have a lot of grass along the Texas coast. And so any flies we tie need to be as weedless as possible. But you can put this fly down right on the bottom if you need to. And it, it's good for redfish, speckled trout. And I had a friend, I took him out. He had never caught a flounder, a southern flounder before. I gave him one of these flies. He got a 21-inch southern flounder on it. So you can, because it's on the bottom, you can... You can put this right in front of a big flounder's nose and he'll jump on it. Okay. So I went ahead and put the barbell on it so you don't have to watch me put on the barbell. Okay, the first step is to put on the gills. And for that, I like this red uh, cactus chenille. It doesn't take much, just about two wraps. If you notice, I'm right below the bend of the hook where it starts to go down. We really like that red cactus chenille for, for gills. Okay. The tail is a bunny strip. I like to use a magnum. And I'm using solid white. Sometimes I'll use grizzled white. You can use chartreuse, blue, lots of different colors that you can use for this fly. But I'm tying it the same as in the magazine, which is all white. Now this magnum is pretty wide. So what I'm gonna do is curve it between my fingers, get it on the hook, and make sure I curve it around the hook and get it centered. Okay, that looks good. I'm gonna hit that with some lacquer to make sure it stays on tight. Now, this is where flaring comes in. I can now take some deer hair, and because I'm not spinning, I can flare it right on top of that bunny strip. So same technique, two above, one, I'm sorry, two below, one above. And I'm gonna make this first one, make two wraps, keep it from spinning, pull down, flare the hair out, pull it back, make my anchor wraps. Now this fly is all one color. So I'm gonna be doing white on the top and the bottom. So I'm going to take a smaller clump 
because I'm on the bottom and I'm going to wind up cutting most of that off. Pull the hair out of the way between two fingers, one wrap, flare it, pull the hair out of the way, make your anchor wraps. But I'm going to move the thread now in front of the barbells. This next bunch of hair, because I want to be able to cover the barbell, is going to be a pretty good bunch of hair. Pull it back, pinch it, unwrap, flare it, anchor it. I'm going to go on the bottom. And I'm going to do one more on the top, and then we're going to be done. Done with the hair. Give her a whip finish. This is challenging because the camera's in the way. A little bit of lacquer. And we're ready to trim. And when I'm trimming hair, I always go with what I call my reference cut, which is the cut that's closest to the hook. And for this fly, it's going to be on the bottom of the hook. So I'm going to start on the bottom and trim right up to the gill. While I'm trimming, I'm going to tell the story of the, the jerk me bend back. Along the Gulf Coast, there's a soft plastic lure called a jerk bait. Very popular, very effective. It's a soft plastic with a hook that's embedded in the soft plastic. And it's kind of long and skinny. But when you jerk it in the water, it, it goes whichever direction, just like a fleeing bait fish. And it's very effective. It's one of the favorite um, lures out there for conventional tackle people. So my goal was to build a fly similar, something that when it's pulled hard in the water, it would go every which direction. So I had to have a nose on it that would be just right. So I, this is tied with a bullet nose that kind of curves up. And when you do pull it, it goes this way, that way, whichever way. And it's been very effective. Uh, I have several people in the club, local club, they're tying these now. And just like my buddy who caught that big flounder, I've had other friends who have caught really nice redfish and big speckled trout. And they like it because it's about as weedless as you can make any fly. Okay, now we see the real benefit of flaring over because you get a nice transition from the deer hair to the bunny strip. A lot of flies that I saw when I was developing this technique were using things like a wool with silicon over it, and you'd get a big fat head, but then the rest of the fly would be very skinny, and it didn't give me the profile that I wanted. A lot of times fish are keying off and not so much color, but the profile of your fly. 
So I wanted to make sure I had a fly that looked just like a bait fish, whether it's a, a mud minnow or a white mullet or striped mullet. A really nice profile. Okay. Now, next step is to get the uh, bunny strip over the hook. So I'm going to poke a hole. I'm going to measure it. I'm going to poke a hole right there. Put the hook through that hole. And I'm going to take some soft text. You need to strengthen that, that bunny strip, or if you get some, especially small trout, they like to pull on the tail. They'll pull the tail off. So I'm going to get some soft text and put it right there. At, the hook goes through. And the soft text is nice, at, and then it soaks into the, the leather and saturates it. Makes it tough. Then the last step is to get the eyes on it. I love doll eyes because they stick out, just like a bait fish's eyes stick out. They're very visible. I think bait fish, or I'm sorry, predator fish key in on eyes. This is the glue I like to use. Loctite stick and seal. I got frustrated because my eyes kept falling off. So I went to Home Depot about 20 something years ago and bought every glue they had. And this is the one that worked the best because it has some nasty chemicals in it, toluene, I believe, that melts the plastic. So this is not a glue where you have hair, then a layer of glue, and then the plastic. It actually melts the hair into the plastic. Now, this glue, if you get it on the on the front of the eye, it will not come off. It'll melt it just instantaneously. So the technique I've come up with to minimize that is you get a little bit of the glue, just touch the eye, pick it up, and put it on the hair. If you get a little too much, you can get the excess off that way. Make sure they're even. And there you go. That's the jerk me bend back fly. That's, uh, that's beautiful. Uh, Dick is asking if he could see your complete bobbin. He only could see the weight and he wants to see the complete bobbin. Is that possible? Kind of just hold sure. it up behind the, behind the fly there. Yep, that'll do it. Wonderful. Okay, um, my question is back on the glue that you put on the rabbit strip at the bend of the hook. When a when a big fish hits that, yeah, when a big fish hits that, does that collapse in and open up the gap so that the gap is wider? Um, in other words, does it slip up and down when it when a force hits it like a fish hitting it? It will eventually if you catch enough fish, but it will Got last it. quite a few fish. The yeah. The largest fish I've caught on this fly is a 31-inch redfish down in the Everglades. Yeah, yeah. It, it didn't tear it up. But if it, especially, like I said, a lot of little trout hit it. It will eventually tear, and sure. then you get to start over again. Okay, cool. Well, uh, that looks good. Any more questions out there? No questions? Yeah, we'll move on with the Uncle Rattle and we'll take the concept of flaring hair over something to the next step. So here is a rattle mullet. This is a fly that was carried by Umpqua for over 20 years. And you can see it has a very nice transition from the deer hair to the bucktail. And that's what I'm looking for again. A very, very nice profile of a bait fish. Not a big head and then it gets real skinny and then there's a bunch of feathers. Hello. The way I accomplished this was by putting a rattle in it. So I tied this one only half the fly. Okay. 
So that's a cutaway view. <clears throat> I love that cutaway view. That is that is cool. Are you ready for the recipe? Yeah, go ahead. All righty. What size are those eyes, that you, the doll eyes? I was hoping somebody wouldn't ask that. I don't remember. What size are these? Are they okay. seven millimeter? Okay. I think they're seven. Anyway, we're moving away from the uh, recipe back to your fly there. I love that cutaway. What a good idea. So you can see the rattle where the rattle is embedded right here. <clears throat> and the goal is to be able to put your deer hair over the rattle. Well, you put, first you put your bucktail on the rattle. Then you put your deer hair over the bucktail. That way you get that nice transition from the deer hair to the bucktail to give you that really nice profile. You just have to use your method. Anybody trying to spin hair around that would just be very frustrated. Uh, I would say it would be impossible. Yeah. Okay, let's do a rattle mold. This one's a bit more complicated. So to John save Wright, some time. John Wright wants to know about the rattle. Okay, there's, he's one step ahead of me. I was going to talk about that. Okay. So th this is a plastic rattle. And I don't know if they make these anymore. I bought a whole bunch of them many years ago. And this was the original rattle that Uncle used when tying the fly. They can't get this rattle anymore, so they started using the glass rattles. Now, the glass rattles are a little more difficult to use than the plastic rattle, but you can still get hair over them and make the fly. And the rattle serves two purposes. One, it's noisy. But I've done some research, and I'm not sure fish can hear a rattle. They only hear lower frequencies is what I've read. But what it does do, and goes back to the profile, is it helps fill out the fly so that it's thick the entire length of the fly. Okay, first step is crystal flash. So you only get a few strands of crystal flash. Oh, my crystal flash fell off. Okay, I have a few strands here. Uh, all synthetics are slick and they have a tendency to pull out. So you get the thread started. So what you want to do is not tie it on directly, but fold over the synthetic. So you get a long strand and you tie in the middle. And then fold it over and tie it again. That way there's no way it's going to pull out. Next step is your hackles. You take four hackles and you want very thin hackles. You don't want great big thick ones. If you do, they'll stick up through the bucktail. So you want to find the thinnest ones you can, four of them, and tie them right on top. Crystal Flash insists on uh, this too. Crystal Flash insists on getting in the middle of it. And these don't have to be perfect or straight because you're going to put bucktail over them and that'll keep them in place. Okay, next is the white bucktail. And for this fly, we want bucktail that's as straight as possible. You can get some bucktail that's really kinky. It doesn't work as well. So go through your bucktail and see how straight these hairs are. You want the straightest ones you can find. You also want very long. So what I'm going to do is grab the end and pull out all the short ones. Okay, this is not very much bucktail. 
what we're going to do is we're going to put some on each side of the hook. Now, this fly is like a deceiver in that the drag of the fly going through the water causes these hackles to go back and forth. So it looks like a fish swimming. So we don't want the bucktail to go past the tips of the feathers that'll impede them moving around. Now, here's another benefit of the, the, th the weight. I call it third hand bobbin weight. I can make two wraps not tighten it down, and I can still move the hair around to put it exactly where I want it. Okay, so I'm gonna put some on that side, and then I'm gonna get some more from the other side of the bucktail. Pull out the short ones. And again, put it on just the side of the hook, making sure the tips do not go past the hackles. Okay, now I can pull down and secure them. So we're doing an olive fly. This fly from Uncle, you can get olive or chartreuse, but I time in a lot of different colors. White over red, I'm sorry, red over white, green over white, chartreuse over white, even blue over white. I'm going to get a pretty good bunch of bucktail for the top. So I got to go 180 degrees around the, uh, the rattle, making sure I don't go past the hackles. Again, I'm going to make two loose wraps just to get the hair in place. Then I can move it around because I want to make sure that green matches right up against the white. I see I missed over here. I can move this hair around and get it lined up exactly the way I want it. Okay, now I can pull down and put some more wraps on it. Now you want to get close to the end of the rattle. If you tie in too far back, you're not going to be able to get your deer hair to cover the thread because you want that deer hair to be right on the end of the rattle. Okay. Now, at this point, I'm going to tie half hitches, tie off the thread, and then I'm going to put a whole bunch of glue on it. This is really a, a two-step fly. This is the first step, and you need to let the glue dry before you start the next step. So what I've done is gone ahead and created another one earlier so we don't have to sit here and wait for it to dry so here's the one i did earlier now comes the deer hair. so we're going to start on the bottom with the white deer hair same technique Get my thread started. You cut the calf tail right at the end of the rattle? Yes, you cut that bucktail as close to the rattle as you can get it. And for the white on the bottom, I'm not going to use a whole lot of hair because I'm going to wind up cutting most of it off. I don't want it to be real thick. This is the exact same technique. Three fingers. I'm going to make two wraps for the first one. Again, I'm not going to pull down until I make sure I have it lined up properly. Okay, I have it where I want it. 
I'm going to hold it, pull down, and flare. Okay, make one more wrap, and I'm going to go on top. Now, this time I'm going to use a pretty big clump of hair. So I want this to be thick. Just a comment on my part. It's uh, real obvious how why you need that extra weight when you're holding that hair in place with just two turns of thread and you're repositioning it under those soft turns. That extra weight is really important. It's really a deal breaker. If you don't have that weight, this technique doesn't work. Okay. Put the hair on top. Make my two loose wraps. Make sure I have the hair lined up on both sides. Then I'm going to hold the hair because sometimes if you pull really hard, you'll pull the hair off the end of the rattle. So I'm going to hold it very pull hard, almost enough to break the thread. And then pull it all back and do my anchor wrap right in front of the rattle. So you see, I'm real close to the end of the rattle. So now when I butt up against the rattle, I shouldn't see a break. I should not see a break from the end of the rattle to where the other deer hair is. A smooth transition. So right in front of the rattle, I'm gonna use a big clump of hair because I gotta fill that gap in front of the, the rattle. Pull it back, put it in place, pull down, flare it out, keep it from spinning, pull back, do my anchor wraps. Now it's just a matter of filling out the rest of the hook, top, bottom, top, bottom. Okay, this is the boring part, watching me do the rest of this. Any questions? I don't have a question, but I have a comment, if I may. Sure, of course. I am just so jazzed about this. I'm a new tire, and I've never seen these techniques before, and I am just astounded how wonderful this is. I'm going to get off this meeting and make one. <laughs> Go make you a third hand bobbin weight? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I tried for many years to learn how to spin hair and I got really frustrated. And that I wasn't good at it. I couldn't get it even and I couldn't get the hair where I wanted it. So that's why I developed this technique. The stacking is good, especially if you want a lot of hair on the hook. You want something that floats very high. But stacking creates circles. And you can't really create stripes with stacking. Do you have a preference towards the kind of deer hair? And I noticed you're also almost always tying it with the um, ends back. Yes, my preference for deer hair is as long and as big as diameter as I can find. That's the key. The bigger the diameter, the easier it flares, the better it flares. And the longer it is, the more options you have on what you can tie. Because I tie some very big flies, so I need some hair that's pretty long. So the guys in the fly shops don't like me because when I go in, I'm looking for hair. I go through every package looking for the best one. And I don't like to buy online because you never know what you're going to get. Yeah. 
there is one technique I'm not showing you. Let me show you this. This is because I'm about tying quickly. You'll see a lot of people with their deer hair, they'll get a comb and comb it out. Here's what I do. Let's see if I can let me pull this out of the way so you can see what I'm doing. Take your deer hair, grab the tips, and then just flare it between your fingers. Now, the second coat of the deer hair, the, the small stuff that you want to get out, is by the the butt end. So it's just a matter of, see how it all comes out? And that's very quick. Okay. Now with this much hair on doing the whip finish can be a challenge. Ooh, cut it. <clears throat> My thread cut. Sometimes the hooks where they bend the eye around will have a little barb and it'll cut your thread. So just to make sure, I'm going to put a little more thread on there. Just to make sure it doesn't come apart. Which means Ron, I get to may I ask? It. Sure. Um, where are you located? Where do you fish? I live in Pearland, Texas, which is due south of Houston. It's between Houston and Freeport. So okay. I fish primarily all up and down the Texas coast. I'm in California. I have fished California once or twice. You need to check the bait fish that are common in that area. But I got a bullet because the, the guys up on the East Coast use this fly for stripers and bluefish. So I don't know if it'll work in California, but I'd be glad to hear from you if you do catch something like a big striper in California on one of these. Before you leave tonight, I'll give you my email address. Let's keep in touch if that's okay with you. Well, sure. Thank you, sir. Especially if you take me fishing in California. You got it. <laughs> okay, thread didn't cut that time. All right. Now, again, the reference cut is the cut closest to the hook, which in this case is on the bottom of the hook. And if you get into deer hair, you have to have a very understanding wife because this stuff gets all over the place. My wife learned to make sure that I had my own office and I do all my fly tongue in my office and she never comes in here. Okay, so I made my reference cut. And so next I'm balancing the distance from the middle of the hook to the edge. I wanna do the same distance on both sides. 
Okay, so it's balanced. And it's a matter of just working around the hook, around the top like this, making sure not to cut too much. And I want that nice bullet head. The scissors I'm using are Dr. Slick's serrated. When you're cutting like this, you really need serrated scissors. Something that'll grab the hair when you cut it. I don't want to cut the bucktail. So what you can do is bend the deer hair up. It'll stick up and allow you to cut it without cutting the bucktail. Now, this fly is designed to sit right in the film surface, for lack of a better term. There's a lot of the grass that we have on the Texas coast is called shoal grass. And it's like pine needles, but when it dies or a crop cuts it, it floats to the surface and it gets caught on everything. So all the flies I design are to try and minimize the amount of shoal grass that gets on the fly. So this fly, if it's balanced properly, will sit just where its nose is on the surface. And that's part of learning to tie this fly is how much deer hair do you put on this one? There's quite a bit of deer hair on this one, so this one's going to float pretty high. This fly does allow you to cover the entire water column. If you move the rattle forward, then you're going to only have a little deer hair. And after it becomes saturated, it'll become neutral buoyant. You can also put barbell weights on the underside, just like I did for the, the jerk me bin back. That will weight it, so then it will sink. So with a combination of floating lines to intermediate sink to full sinking lines, you can cover the whole water column. One of guys that I know, he uses this fly in the wintertime. He ties a lot of deer hair on it, but he ties it on with a full sinking line. So the full sinking line's on the bottom, but the fly floats off about six inches to a foot off the bottom. And that's very effective in cold weather for big trout. Okay, nice profile. Next thing is to put the weed guard on. So I found out that if you do a full circle loop, like I do for bass, if you do that in salt water, it's very weedless. It's also speckled troutless. Speckled trout are from the weak fish family. The weak fish family have very soft mouths. And they'll hit that fly and will not get hooked up if you have a full loop. So I use just a single strand of 50-pound monofilament for this size fly. I'm going to cut it off right there. All right. Now, whenever you're using monofilament, you want to get some sandpaper and scratch the monofilament where you're tying it in. That gives the glue something to grab hold of. Otherwise, the model fiddlement's so slick, it'll usually pull out. Now, these hooks have such big eyes, you can do this. You can put the mono through the eye and still have enough room to tie in your leader.
is the weed guard a whip finish? There was some lacquer. Uh, another way to keep that mono from pulling out, I don't have my burner plugged in, but it's to burn the mono right there. And it puts a little tag on it, and that way it won't pull through the thread. And I'm going to clip this right at the point of the hook. That 50 pound is strong enough to keep the shoulder grass off, but not so much that you keep the speckle trout off. Last thing, get the eyes on. Same way as before, I'm gonna use the Loctite stick and seal. Get a little glue on my needle, pick up the eye and put it on the hair. And that's the rattle motor. Beautiful job. Any questions out there? Is that the natural curvature to the mono or did you form it? It's a natural that's curvature as it comes off the spool. And this is 50 pound Andy, which is a very inexpensive, but very stiff monofilament. I have a question. Do you ever use razor blades to trim the deer here, or is it all scissors? That's a very good question. I developed this technique with my son sitting in my lap when he was three years old, and my wife forbade me from having razor blades on my desk. <laughs> so I learned to do everything with the scissors. And some of the techniques that I have, you really can't do with a razor blade. I'll give you an example. Going back to the mohawk minnow that, that's where my mind was going how do you keep from cutting off that fin you yep. develop very good Six. techniques with the scissors yeah but the real thing is okay let me show you from this direction to see the bottom how it has almost like a keel mm -hmm. okay you have a good profile so if a bass sees it from this side it has a profile of a sunfish but the trick is, if you get too much hair underneath the hook, the buoyancy of the hair will be greater than the weight of the hook from the bend to the point, and the fly will turn sideways. It won't sit in the water like this. This fly is designed to sit in the water, so the water level is about right here. When you pull it, it goes under. The mohawk sucks in a couple of bubbles, and it floats back to the top. And the goal is to mimic a sunfish that's feeding on the surface. This technique, I'm doing the keel. The only way I figured out to do that is you have your scissors and you cut like this. <clears throat> I don't know that I could do that. I couldn't figure out how to do that with a razor blade. Excuse me, Ron, I have a question. Have you ever experimented with the test of line that you use to make that weed guard? I mean, would a hundred pound test be too much or? So the, the variables that you're working with are, first of all, the diameter of the hook eye. If you get something that's too big around diameter, you're going to fill up the space in the hook eye. Ah. For some like in freshwater, I do tie it off to the side because the freshwater hook eyes are very small. That is awkward and it's kind of difficult to do. And then sometimes you get a weed guard that's off to the side, which will sometimes cause the fly not to swim straight through the water. So the first one is diameter of the eye. The second one is, you, especially if you're fishing for speckled trout, you don't want something that's so strong that when the fish hits it, 
they're not going to get hooked up. Ah, uh, thank you, sir. So for a one off, this is a one odd hook. I should have told you that's one odd hook. Fifty pound is good. It's a heavy fly, and uh, when a trout hits it, it'll move out of the way. If I'm tying this in a like a four, much smaller, then I go down to a thirty pound handy. So on the weed guard on that one, you cut it off at the hook point. Right at the, the other hook one, point. You, you've looped it around. What's your difference on those and reasoning? Okay, so bass are much more aggressive than sun than a speckled trout, and they have a very hard mouth. They crush and kill their bait. What they're eating, I mean, they just demolish flies. Here, uh, as an example. Here's one of my flies that's caught probably 50 bass. And it's just, I mean, it, they tore it apart. They ripped the eye off even. I've had somebody break the eye, crack the eye. They hit it so hard. They pulled some of the feathers out of it. Okay, so bass are very strong, crush their, their, uh, their bait fish, and they're in heavy structure, heavy grass and brush. So you want something that's going to keep that the brush of the sticks off the hook. If you notice too, I use a stinger hook here that curves up a little bit. That helps keeps it weedless. So I can cast this fly right back up into the grass and in the in the trees, and it's pretty much weedless. But if a big bass hits it, I'm going to hook him. So it depends on the species, I guess is the answer. Hey Ron, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know we had a a few technical problems, but, but as always, the, the presentation was phenomenal. I just, I'll have, I don't know whether there'll be dreams tonight about this or nightmares. We'll have to decide. <laughs> <laughs> just anyway. remember this technique. I mean, we didn't talk about this, but you can put this, you can now do deer hair over anything. Now, I don't do a whole lot of cold water fly fishing and kind of far away from it. But I'm thinking about some, some flies where you could use this, like some terrestrials. Or uh, what is that fly that Dave Whitlock had? It's a bait fish pattern of a bait fish that sits on the bottom. You talking about the sculpin? Yeah, sculpin. Yeah. yeah, that I was just looking at that and say, I won't take me very long to modify that to a sculpin. I can tell you yeah. that hard. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, there's for sure. Of, for sure. There's a Thank lot of streamer you. patterns that that'll be great on, especially for crappie and uh, walleye. Nice. I'd like Great. to see those. Thank, thank you much, guys. Thank you, Ron. We're getting ready now to move into the weekly tip. We're going to talk about a new old material. And one of the reasons that I can talk about that material tonight is because the guy that introduced it on this channel is at the Oregon show right now. And, uh, he won't know that I'm repeating what he did, but I was so impressed with it. I wanted to share with it with all of you, and it was on a one of our smaller uh, presentations. Anyway, let me uh, move over to the materials. And this is the stuff right here. It's called Hemingway Synthetic Peacock Quills. Comes in 10 different colors, and they're the the, the 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 hint of a color semi-transparent and like this one this is the clear one what's interesting let me move up to the uh, vice camera and this is the stuff right here and in fact if you look on the chat i put uh, an, uh, an amazon link in there it'll take you right to the page that where we got this one. And what I'd like you to notice is these uh, stripes here. They're at each stripe. Uh, let me start right just right here at, at, the, at the bottom here. You can see you've got the top and the bottom of that stripe. Well, that's not actually a single stripe. That's a stripe of, mono, of monofilament to semi-transparent that is cut from one corner to the other corner, making each of the two stripes that that looks like that is right there, 
that, that will make them a tapered quill to, to put on the hook. Well, anyway, this is the clear one. And the other colors will, of course, be tending towards their color, orange and natural and all that stuff. But the clear one is the one I wanted to share with you tonight. Because let me set that aside. And we're going to look at some of the flies. Now, that clear one, I wonder what would happen if I, well, let's say, uh, wrapped it over black thread. Well, that's what happens. You can't tell a darn thing's there. I mean, so I just spent a lot of money for a quill, and the fish will think it's a black fly, which I could have imitated with a whole lot of things. Let me set that aside. What if I do it over orange thread? And that's what it's like over orange thread. Well, let's take even a, a tighter look. I like that. That that has some real possibilities. And the last one that I did was over gray. So the gave you just some some different options, and also the spacing between the turns. Uh, I, I made that spacing a little wider, so you can put the rib type stuff closer together, further apart, the color that you put under it, or the color that you purchase. Now, like the this one is red, so you, it's pretty obvious what the color background color is going to be, and then there's other colors as well. But I just wanted to share that with all of you tonight. It is something that you can get if you want. Uh, it's a little on the spendy side, and will I replace it on all of our flies that require quill bodies? Probably not. I like the natural quill, but that said, this this place has got a this stuff has got a place, and you can decide if it's got a place in your fly box or not. <laughs> hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us this week. Until next Friday, take care. <laughs>